Thank you very much for coming. I think it's a little bit hard to do this right after lunch. Everybody had a little bit of food, you're a little bit tired, but I recommend that you just enjoy, relax. I got the energy for you today, so no problem, okay? We're just gonna wait for the last people to walk in, then we get started. But as a matter of fact, I wanted to start off by saying thank you. I think that it's a pleasure to be here today. It's a pleasure to, um, to see so many people come together for the same purpose. And of course, it's a pleasure to share some of our insights with you. I am uh, Thomas. I work at Gradual Land. Gradual Land is a network of students from all around Europe. And what I would like to do today is to share with you some of the things that are working. Um, whenever I sit in the audience and I'm listening to a presentation, I always wonder who these people are and why I should listen to them. So I just want you to know a little bit about me. Very, very little. Um, I am originally from Brazil, but I have lived most of my life in Denmark. I have had my own company in the past that helped other companies communicate with customers. And a few years back, I actually took the leap and I started working within HR, so helping companies speak with candidates. The goal for today, so the reason why we're all sitting here at the same time, is that I would like to refresh some of the views that we have on recruitment trends. So just provide you a little bit with some updates, uh, look into some best practices. So concretely speaking, what has been working? And then last but not least, leave you guys with some recommendations. So that by the time you leave here today, you can have some new ideas that you can implement from not tomorrow, because it's Saturday, but on Monday, yeah? So, why are we here today to talk about junior recruitment? I think that um, there are many reasons, and all the speakers here are being very fantastic at showcasing how the value is added in the recruitment process. But the main reason why we are here today talking about junior recruitment is because more than ever before, the gap between the expectation and reality is super high. So basically, I don't know if anybody has felt this before, but sometimes we look at an opportunity, and if you have a friend like this, let me know. But I hear it so, so, so often where people are telling me, I found this job, but if I take it, I will move to San Francisco. And then what am I going to do with my dog? And you sit and you say, you have not applied. <laughs> so many things can change. And it's by really looking at what the job will really be like, what would this process be through, that sometimes it turns out to be a little bit of a negative experience for the candidates, yeah? So our goal today is to try to understand that in order for you to retain candidates in the company, this all starts in the attraction phase. We need to make sure that we are recruiting the right people so that they will stay longer and happier. The idea, making it very visual because it is after lunch, is that we always imagine that we're going to work in a place like this. So it's super nice, super engaging, you're talking to people, colorful, but very often we end up here. So it is a cubicle, and you're working by yourself, and it's a much more of your own ideas than sharing it with the team. And it's really this gap between the two that we would like to prevent from happening, because that costs money, yeah? So we will be talking today about how to recruit the future of your company, because the future of your company is not only about the decisions you make, but it's also about the people that are going to have the motivation and the vision to bring it forward, yeah? I know that this is a presentation, but I'm a very informal guy, so if anybody has any questions, just feel free to let me know. It's really relaxed. But the way that we're going to be looking at this gap today and looking at how we can prevent this from an attraction phase of the recruitment cycle is that we're first going to look at uh, candidate trends. So what is happening, what has changed, and what is it that we can conclude from everything? We're going to look at some company best practices. So my role at Gradual Land is that I'm responsible for going all around Europe and talking to the biggest employers to understand their pains, their challenges, and how they're actually solving this. We have a lot of candidates in our network, and we need to make sure they have jobs. So it's from the data and the red thread from talking to so many companies into so many different environments that today we're going to be able to share with you a little bit on best practices. And I just want you to know that this is in a European scope, so all of this data is the average for all of the European countries that we work with, okay? We'll then dive into some university development, so how are they working with these uh, candidates, and then round it off with some recommendations. So, 
we will be direct and we will jump right to it. We're first going to look into the candidates. So when we talk about candidates, it's very important that we understand that there are two sides to this. And I would like to present you this information into two different ways. The first one is the data. We were talking about it before. The last presenter is right here. He knows what this is about. <laughs> but the idea is that we all need data to prove things. But we also wanted to give them a chance to speak up and share some of their internal frustrations or challenges. So I'll show you a little bit on the two sides. First, looking at the yearly activity in Europe. What does this mean? This means that we always have jobs to fill. We always have a lot of different things happening in the office. We know <laughs> HR is one of the busiest departments in the company, even though we always have to smile. Um, so it's a matter of doing things at the right time. It's about understanding when is good so that whatever you do, you have the most return from that. The first graph on that side, on the right side, it says applying for jobs. And what that is, and all of this will be available for you afterwards, so you don't need to uh, write it down, but it is a graph that indicates throughout the whole year when are candidates applying more for jobs. So instead of you publishing an opportunity in June and waiting two months to fill it, if you have the possibility of launching it before summer, so April, that is one of our biggest peaks, then try to put that opportunity, even if it is a little bit of a generic job advert, but to build that talent pipe when they are already looking for these jobs. We also put two graphs here in the bottom that are showing you a little bit into the job views. So this is not only when they're applying, but when are they starting to investigate? When do you need to be ready? <laughs> and of course, the last graph is a little bit more nerdy, but I think it's very interesting. It is in terms of the days of the week. So by looking at that, we can conclude that Wednesday is the best day to actually um, have your opportunity online because that's when most of the people are sending in their application. They have the weekend, they come back, they're a little bit frustrated. Wednesday, they take action and they prepare for the next weekend. But that is a given. And we know that by acting at the right time, you will get a better response. But it's also about understanding how are they looking for these jobs? What is it that they do? These numbers represent our network, of course, and this is only taking into account the candidates that are looking for jobs on our web browser. So not an online application, just simply they are accessing it through their phone. And we can see a 14% increase from 2017 to 2019. It's not the, the biggest. Uh, we actually expected this to be a little bit bigger, but the idea is that it is increasing and it is our responsibility not to upload jobs that are not mobile friendly. <laughs> uh, PDFs are very, very good. Word formats are very, very good as well. But sometimes we have some job adverts that we look at and we say, that might not perform. So everything needs to be very mobile friendly because this is the way to move forward. We also know that nowadays, candidates apply for an average of four, four jobs a month. So they only send four applications. We are, of course, on our side doing quite a lot to make sure that they are ready. They know how to research, they know how to prepare so that their cover letter is really, really good. But the idea is they're trying to go for better opportunities and not like it was a few years ago, bombarding this and sending out in, uh, <laughs> recruitment uh, applications everywhere. I'm sure we've all received here. Can you raise your hand if you have received uh, an application that you were like, why? <laughs> Anybody? Yes. See? So the idea is that this is getting better. They are getting more focused. And I would like to share with you a little bit into how this is happening. We also know that uh, one in every four candidates looks for employer branding information before they apply. What does this mean? It means that candidates are not just interested anymore on, and they are juniors, the ones we're speaking with, they have started university or graduated in the past three years. Before it was much more about getting a job and paying the bills, but now they want a vision. They're looking for a career. And that's why it's so important for them to have the possibility to investigate this and to learn whether the company's idea for the future fits with theirs. A way that a lot of companies are doing this is that they're being more transparent. So the idea is that every time that there was an online engagement with candidates, we tend to see a 58% um, conclusion from these candidates. What does that mean? That if we look at 950 people that have had an engagement with a company, online in this case, 557 of those will go ahead and apply for the job. We know that some of them will talk to the companies and figure out that maybe that's not what they want, and that's okay too, but this is definitely something that we have been very impressed throughout the last few years on how important it is for candidates to have a chance to engage. 
Those were some of the trends. That's a little bit onto what is actually happening right now. But more than that, I think it's very important that we have a chance for people to speak up. So we actually at Graduland took it a step further and made it a, made a little video for you to understand what our candidates like today. My name is Crystal and I'm 28 years old. Uh, I'm just finishing up my master's degree in um, business administration and organizational communication at CVS. Uh, so my name is Duncan. I, um, I have a master's in uh, e-business. I just graduated last year and I'm currently um, looking for jobs. Um, I'm William and I'm currently employed at Abacus as a consultant for their business development. At first it was an open application as well, um, but they invited me to an interview and uh, we talked it over what, I could, what position I could take. And uh, when it then started later that summer, uh, it was something totally different. In terms of uh, bad experience, um, that would be, for instance, um, the interviewer, uh, their facial expressions uh, suddenly changes, which maybe does not mean that uh, you're not going to get the job. I think the signals that were sent uh, were a bit negative. The worst experience I would say is maybe some, sometimes you put time into it, into applying and you don't hear back or, or you have, it's not very clear what they want or what skills they want. There's so many opportunities to follow that you really need to see which one suits you best and I think that's, I don't know if it's a very millennial thing, but it, it is something that you want to always do not only follow the company that you are suited for or the suits you as well, that you guys could work together or for what the company strives for. One of the main challenges I think is, uh, is that most companies want something specific um, and they want you to fit in like a, a small box and yet I don't, I don't know if they are open-minded towards it, at least it doesn't say in the, in the advert. The main challenge uh, would be uh, getting actually a feedback uh, in terms of the applications that uh, I've already made. Uh, just to uh, just to know exactly what I should do better uh, in order to get the job next time. I think they should open up the advert a bit more sometimes and when doing that they should be open-minded uh, to be able to reach uh, as wide as possible I think. First and foremost it's good to respond it's just uh, it just makes it it just makes uh, you you know where you stand uh, you don't need to wait, uh, especially when you've applied for, uh, for several jobs. As we talked earlier about the whole developing kind of young, uh, young talents and allowing them to grow within the company, I think that's a very positive thing that they're doing. I think uh, a lot of companies require huge work experience at early stages at an entry job, which makes it very complicated. So I, I, would be, I would suggest to be willing to let the person grow together with the company. I think that's something very nice. Yeah. So that was just to show you guys from a different perspective. I know it's hard to watch a video after lunch, but thank you for holding on with me. But the idea is that they are also struggling. They're also, from their perspective, this is a challenge. And from their perspective, they don't always see how they fit in. So what all of this data is showing us, both the quantitative and the qualitative, is that candidates nowadays are changing. They're changing because of their environment, they're changing because they're always on their phone, and they're changing because their expectations are different than what they were before. We're gonna summarize this in a minute, but before we can actually move over, I just wanna actually touch upon the employers, because that is where we sit today. So we understand a little bit about what the candidates do. We understand their expectations, a little bit into their behaviors. And now what I would like to do today is to actually dive into two best practices that I believe can give you very constructive feedback. The first one is actually one of our partners. I am not able to disclose the name of the company, but the idea is that they were really struggling. They had a really, really big challenge that had to do with salary gap, as well as they were hiring for a temporary job. Those two things, when trying to convince candidates to go to another country, don't make it that exciting. So they really, really struggle to get the number of applications that they needed for that specific campaign. The way that they were approaching this challenge was that they would always launch the program, then they would promote it, very, very basic, very, very simply speaking, and then do calls to action. I don't know if we have ever received one of these emails, but click here and apply, or this job is great for you. And 
That is what they had been doing for various years. So we took it upon ourselves to use that data from the, in, from the candidates and try to teach them this and educate them so that we could find ways to do this better. In 2008, the company had received 6,864 views to all of their jobs. And in total, they had 84 applications. This is a very low conversion rate. And that's why it was so alarming for us. And it made us really tick and try to want to solve this. In 2009, they gave us a chance. And we decided to do things differently. So what did we do? The first thing that we did was since we know the candidates want to know more about the vision and more about the whole package of how that would influence in their life, we started earlier. We started three months earlier than they did before. We started when we knew that there was an application peak, so that the candidates were already looking for job opportunities. And then what did we do? We actually made it into three sets, one every month, where we did not talk about the job. We talked about what it was like to live in Madrid, we talked about the company culture, and we talked about the recruitment intake. So that there were no questions. What is going to happen? Am I going to get a response? Are you going to write me? Should I write you? This is not dating. <laughs> These questions don't need to be there. So we actually made it very simple. So when we talked about recruitment intake, we told them dates. We gave them insights. We told them how they would be evaluated, which tools we would be using, just so that from their side, they could understand that we were willing to give them a chance and not just block them or take them out if they didn't have the right fit. To make it a little bit more visual, this is a little bit on the insights that we sent to them. This was a direct mail campaign that we wrote about uh, working in Madrid. And if you read it very closely over there, if it's not too small, it says, uh, working in another country provides you with a unique opportunity to get to know new places, new people, and new experiences. Nothing to do with the job. Nothing to do with what they're going to be performing, but simply showing them how great this opportunity could be. Part of my job is also to attend quite a lot of conferences. And I don't know if you guys have heard about this uh, term, but all around Europe, it is very, very popular. And that is the me brand. Has anybody heard about that? No? OK. The me brand is something that is clashing as day in and day out. The idea is that people don't just want to know what is it like to work for you. Candidates nowadays want to take it even further. And they want to know, what am I going to tell my friends when I work for you? Will I be cool? Will I be cheesy? So this is a lot of the different questions that were not present in the past and are now becoming part of their expectations. So we send out these campaigns. We inform them about the whole idea, what it was like, how it could improve, and how, could be, how it could be really, really exciting for them to be part of our team. And then we again took it further. So since we knew that candidates really, really like to engage with somebody from the company, they like to get something more real, we developed these opportunities, live testimonials. Since the candidates like to know what is it like to work for you, they want to know what is it like to be a part of your team, we took it a step further. So live testimonials was us taking the candidates that had won that job the year before, the ones that got recruited, to come online and share their experience. It's a very simple process, but you would be surprised about how attractive this was. It was just somebody, instead of an HR person, somebody that they could relate to. And that really, really allowed them to see themselves in that opportunity. We promoted the job, of course, like it always should have. And then we also focused on languages. One of the challenges that we had with them was that they needed people with seven different languages from all around Europe. <laughs> and they also needed to test them. Because a lot of people say they know these languages, but I have to admit, I don't know Russian. But it's better I admit it now than if I try. <laughs> so we actually put somebody that could speak that native language to share their testimonials with these candidates later on. So we made big testimonial session. They all got to interact with one another. We promoted the jobs. We evaluated which profiles were they missing more applications from. And then that was exactly the ones we invited to have their own language section focus. This is what it was like when we say, I'm really tempted to go down here, but I will not, because I've been told I need to stand in the stage. But the idea is, it was a little video from one of our, their past employers explaining what it was like, sharing some of his experience, the main things he liked about the company, and really answering some very, very basic questions, but giving a face to the company. We had one of our, uh, in one of our researches, and we conduct semesterly researches with our database just to understand what's happening and how we should progress. And we also do this qualitative interview. So we invited some candidates over the office the other day. And one of them said something that really, really stuck with me. And he said, imagine that I have never applied for a job in my life. <laughs> and I have my CV in hands and I'm standing in front of Deloitte. <laughs> he said, I can't go in there. 
I don't know what to do. And it was based on that feedback that we decided to put a, f an, a face to the company. So that it's not just a logo, it's not just a corporate image that they see, but it's really somebody they can relate to. Yeah? This is a little bit onto uh, how they were chatting with the, with the candidates, potential ones. So we did a whole pre-selection, only the ones that had the profile that they needed, so the hard skills could actually go ahead and chat with them so that they can access a little bit on the soft skills, the language skills, and really be transparent with um, one another. This was the whole track that we did together. We then sat down in the end together, us and our partners, and we evaluated the whole streamline through this. So what happened? And I'm very happy to say that uh, they got really, really, really good responses. The fact that it became more human was more attractive, so a lot more people were looking at the job, a lot more people were interested in reading more, and they received 127 applications, which for them was a big win. We were very, very precise on the filtering, so there were only applicants from people who had the profile they were looking for. Yeah? This was first case study. And it's just to show you a little bit that sometimes we need to start a little earlier. We need to be a little bit more proactive, but always try to be transparent. The other case study that I have today might relate to some of the situations you guys find yourselves in. So the challenge here was to deconstruct a formal image of an older, more traditional organization. So it's a company that has been around for years. <laughs> Everybody's super formal in the company. They have a very traditional way of development, a very easy but very, very outdated process inside the company. And they need to recruit juniors, and they want to get these people in. So what can we do, or if that was the question they imposed to us, what could we do to make them more sexy? <laughs> Again, how did this start? This was their original campaign. They would make all of their employer branding uh, material online often uh, a month before the campaign was launched. They did have uh, live sessions, which were opportunities for the candidates to speak with the companies. They promoted it, and they did a call to action, very, very basic, like many, many companies do. So we again took it a step further. We knew that their results were 13,000 job views, 351 apply clicks. This company had a very specific need because they said, we don't need these numbers to increase from views. We don't want more people to see it. We just want to convert them better. We looked at every single profile that had actually sent in an application, and we could see that they had the right approach. And a lot of the people that were looking at the job were exactly what they wanted. <laughs> but people were not applying. So our goal here was to improve the conversion rate from when candidates are looking at a job and convincing them to actually go ahead and apply. The way that we did that is we decided not to guess. <laughs> so we actually pre-selected everybody that had the exact profile they wanted, everybody that actually had all the enthusiasm but they didn't apply, and we sent them a survey. So we said, how come you did not apply for our spring internships? What is happening? And the biggest response rate we got for, was for the last option that said, I did not meet the application requirements. And that is when we hit a wall and we said, wow, we found it. They actually have the profile, but they did not know that they were fitting the work requirements. It comes back to that whole idea, how we present the job, how we describe it. But those are very basic things everybody here knows how to do, so I'm not going to go into detail about that. But we took that into account. Once again, we knew that they needed to be convinced that this was an innovative company. We knew that they needed to look at this in a cooler way. So we started early again. We launched their employer branding information, but we also have them, had them join a virtual career fair. And a virtual career fair, very easily speaking, is an online event that all of our universities that we work with from all around Europe get their candidates to come online. So your reach is much higher. You can definitely have a much better approach to peaking, and we always make these virtual career fairs when there's a peak of application. So it's just about, again, making sure that you are there at the right time. I want to be very transparent as well and say that the virtual career fair was earlier <laughs> than when the campaign was launched. And that was a challenge for them. So what we did was we made a generic job application where it talked again very much about the company's growth and where they were going, and candidates got to be added to the pipeline through that. We then launched the campaign. It was very, very good. There was already a buzz around. People were already talking about this. Then we made live Q&As. Because we knew that a lot of the candidates didn't feel like they fit in the requirements, we actually made sure that they had open question sessions. We are approachable. We are a company that we're not scared of candidates. So feel free, come by, ask us whatever you want. 
This was again very, very simple for them because it was only a one hour time slot that they were available on their side, but it worked fantastically. That was not me. <laughs> but I hope you're good, <laughs> whoever did that. Um, we then promoted, and uh, the last step that we took is actually very, very good because we managed to take it a step further. And can you guys hear me? Yeah, it's good? All right. <laughs> is this the part I have to dance? <laughs> take that. Okay. Hello? Hello? I think it's coming, guys. But I can speak loud. It's okay. We'll make this work. You can hear it. Okay. Thank you. Beautiful. Yeah? <laughs> it happens. It's an IT conference. It's okay. <laughs> but basically, the last step that we took together was... <laughs> Sorry, man. I will continue, okay? Even without a microphone. We got a time schedule here. <laughs> yes. Okay. So, <laughs> no rapping for me today. <laughs> I don't have that skill. Maybe in the evening. Let's see. But for now, what I want you guys to know is that the way that this ended up is that we often talk, and Gradualent is an online platform. But we often talk about online and everything should be digital and everything should be available for everybody. But it doesn't always necessarily have to be like that. Because these, co these candidates wanted to feel more approached by the company, they wanted to feel more related, we actually combined the two. So this is an example from another company, but basically they were hosting offline events, so assessment centers and uh, evening cocktails, and so on. So we actually pre-selected, again, all these candidates that had the right profile, and we invited them to come join. So it was a very good match between what they were doing online and converting that into an opportunity for them to come together. Yeah? All in all, by the end of 2019, I'm very, very glad to say that the number of views remain almost the same, but we definitely managed to increase the conversion rate. Because from the same campaign that we had run the previous year, we actually almost doubled the amount of applications that were coming in. So it was very, very simple. It didn't cost them any extra money. It was just about saying the right things that the candidates thought was very interesting. Yeah? So this was some of the case studies. This is a little bit onto what some companies are doing. I hope that brightens the light to you. And I'm actually going to take it a little bit further because I want you guys to know what to do tomorrow. Again, Monday, tomorrow, Saturday. So our best practices are if you are going to speak with candidates or if you are looking to receive applications, make sure all of your material is online Wednesdays before 2 o'clock. Because every Wednesday between 2 o'clock and 5.30, that's when we see the most amount of applications being sent all around Europe. So this is really, really constructive. Do it at the right time. Save yourself some time. That's great. <laughs> Number two, keep candidates in the loop. You heard it before when, they were, when the actual in candidate in the interview was saying that they never heard back. They don't know what that is. So we have our ways that we keep candidates in the loop, but an automatic response, a copy-paste, anything, but just show them that you are a person too, and that if they took the time to send an application, just a thank you does it. Yeah? Last but not least, we talked about approaching them digitally. And there's one point about this that I really want to make and stress because we strongly believe in it. Of course, developing live sessions and virtual career fairs, those are good options. Those are our options. But there's so many companies that do it in any, many different ways. And what I want you to take away from this is it's not about using a specific way to do it, but it's about having an active employer brand. You're responding to companies, to candidates that are applying for the job. You're actually making yourself available. It's you being employer branding. We are what the company stands for. So we should always make sure that all of this is available and that they see that they can approach us, especially between 2 and 5.30. <laughs> but we need to move forward. And this is a presentation with a point. So we'll develop onto the third pillar now the universities, because one thing is talking about the candidates. They're ready, they're looking for jobs, we know how they're acting, we know how the companies are trying to attract them, but the main idea here is there's a third, 
third pillar, a third player that is very, very influential to this. And those are the universities that we work with. They are the ones training these candidates on how to apply for a job, on how should they prepare. And I want to share with you guys some of the input that we had from them. What we did, because this is an IT conference, and I wanted to make this as specific as I could, <laughs> We actually sat down with the two best IT universities that we know. One is DTU, Danish Technical University, and the second one is ITU, IT University of Copenhagen. They are leading in robotics and video games uh, majors, and they are very, very good. So we took a step further and we actually did an interview with both of them, and we said, hey, how are you keeping your candidates updated? What are you doing to attract new people in the future? And what would you recommend recruiters when they're trying to recruit your candidates? So, I want to share some of these insights with you so that you fully understand how these candidates are being prepared. The first question was, how are you keeping candidates updated for the industry? Many of us here recruit for IT. I'm not a recruiter myself, but I know that it is a very, very challenging profile to acquire. Not only because they have their own methods, but also because they are very, very specific on the skills that they need. What we actually got from DTU was that the way that they are trying to make sure that everything is rolling forward positively is that they're, meeting, they're allowing companies to meet at lectures. Now, candidates are not just doing case studies of what could have been a problem. Companies are actually approaching these universities and sharing their real life challenges so that the candidates can look into a way to solve this. Again, there is no right answer. There is no yes and no. It's some, simply an open case where they can actually go ahead and try to solve. Companies are also developing workshops, so it's about taking the candidates by the hand, teaching them a little bit about how you can actually progress through this process and arrive at the answer that you expect. And they conducted something called a high-tech summit. Has anybody heard about this before? No? It's a really, really big summit that we have, uh, especially in Denmark. And it's very, very known because even our prime minister is there. But it was a way that the university has done to make this exciting. It's not inside the campus. It's not about the lectures. It's about companies coming in and showing and explaining and making this as much of an awesome opportunity as they can be. We then took the same questions to ITU and we said, okay, what are you guys doing in comparison? These two are very competitive, so I did not tell them that I was interviewing with the other. So <laughs> the first answer she said is that they're constantly updating the content of the education, which is clear. We all expected that, and that's pretty, pretty good. I'm very happy that they are still on this track. But the second thing they talked about was the employer's panel. I personally did not know that this existed, but basically they have joined forces with enterprises. And normally when we talk to big universities, they say, yes, we have KPMG and we have this and we have that. But this university actually had a different approach. They made their panel from companies that are small, medium, and large sizes so that every single company could give an input into what is relevant for them that these candidates should be learning. To sum this up, what they do, and this is a step further, I don't know if it can be done in Russia, but companies that are attending this employer panel need to sign something called an employment ticket. And that means that they're signing under that if the candidates have the skills that they have informed the universities for, those companies have the upper hand and they can recruit these candidates right after they graduate. So it's an employment ticket and they have the right to recruit these people above others. As well as projects, collaborations, mini theses, internships, all of these things for them is a way that they're updating the candidates into what's happening in real companies. Yeah? The second question, how are you attracting more students for your future intakes? One of my biggest partners is Amazon, and Amazon is constantly looking for female IT candidates. So that was also a part of this question. How are you attracting future candidates, getting more people into IT, especially females? I don't know if that is a challenge that you face here in Russia, but definitely is a struggle. <laughs> Basically, DTU told us that they're doing new lines. So they're changing the name of their educations. Right now, one of their already existing lines has changed names to artificial intelligence. And they were blown away by the response. They actually had 30 people join the course. They had to add it up to 45, and they're looking to get 65 in next year. Because just by making it more appealing and more relatable to them with more current terms, there are a lot more people trying to be a part of this. They're also developing master thesis. Again, candidates want to know what is it like down the line, <laughs> not just right now, not just solving their monthly 
profitable issue now. <laughs> but actually, how can they proceed? What masters can they take? What opportunities can they be a part of when studying this topic? And then one to two events for high school girls. So they actually bring in girls from high school. They give them a whole Princess Day. They give them a walk through. They take them out. It's a big event, and they do everything possible to make this, again, approachable. The word here is approachable. We then took the same questions to ITU, and we asked them about the same thing. And what we learned is that they focus a lot in branding student life. So they understood that it's not only about the lecture, but candidates want to have a nice lifestyle. They want to see what it's like to be a part of this IT world. So they do a whole big effort into making sure that this life is branded, all of their events, everything is easy to find, so that they see this as a very, very exciting way. They also do a lot of events and activities, of course. So they do coding cafes, IT camps, only for girls, <laughs> uh, student for a day. So they, let, they invite all of the high schools to, if you're interested, come by. You can join one of our lessons. You can have lunch with our students. And the coolest thing is that they have students online 24-7-ish, not at the evenings, but um, where you can just go ahead and ask them questions. So it's very much like on Facebook. You can see all of the students that are online right now, and you, looking to apply, can click on them and ask them, what are you learning in class now? What is it that you're looking at? How is your weekend going to look? So they really made it much easier for this communication to happen. And the best one, I actually feel is the last point here, life after ITU. So they actually conjoined forces with the social medias that everyone's using now. So every single candidate has graduated from ITU in the past year has the opportunity of taking over the university's Instagram to show what their life is like after they finish their studies. It's very, very basic, but it really shows them and it becomes much more engaging because we're speaking the same language now and we are where they are. Again, we continued with the questions and we said, what kind of tips would you give employers? If you're the one training these people to go for a job, what do you think is going wrong? What do you think that companies need to do better when trying to recruit these people? DTU said that he recommends companies to offer more junior opportunities. Very often, Internships are not about learning. And he said, the more, the better. Anything that can allow them to walk into your office will be very, very good. More touch points, online, offline, the opportunity to talk, but really making themselves available. And then provide candidates with knowledge. I think that we can all agree that if I was standing here and providing you with some information that was irrelevant, everyone would be on their phones. And it's the same thing with these candidates. They need knowledge. So if you want to get a developer that is fantastic at developing, bring your best developer and you have him teach that person something. Because once he realizes that that company has a source of knowledge, if he's a motivated candidate, he will definitely pick you first. We then again uh, went to ITU and asked the same question. And they said, all students are getting headhunted much earlier than the previous years. You need to be proactive. She said, in the last year of university, majority of them already have jobs. And she said, they're better jobs than I had when I graduated. And they're good paying jobs too. So we need to start acting early. That's why those best practices worked so well, because we started before all of the other companies that were looking for that same program. They also said that you need to be flexible with the profiles, because candidates can learn. I think this is the biggest takeaway I had from this interview, the fact that these candidates, it's not that they're learning a specific skill. They're actually learning how to learn. They're learning how to learn under pressure. They're learning how to learn with deadlines. And that's the potential that they have. Maybe they don't have the five to 10 years experience. Maybe as they said in the interview, they don't fit into that box. But the idea is that they can learn. So give them a chance and they definitely will catch up. And then, of course, digital with a focus on group work. Everything that these universities are doing now is not to make IT people that quiet, alone profile. They're trying to get people to work together. They're trying to teach them that they can do and go further by joining forces. So any kind of recruitment opportunity that you would like to make for junior candidates, try to make it into group work. They feel more approached, they feel more uh, appealed to it, and they feel more comfortable joining these opportunities. So just to sum this up, I'm at the end of my presentation. I know, I'm also a little sad about that. But the truth is, there is a synergy between these three pillars that has shown us what is working. 
It is not about just talking on the candidates or the employers, but it's about how they come together. So how they link. So before we leave today, I want you to have some concrete takeaways. And you're able to ask whatever you like. But summing it all up so that you can start from Monday, we can right away say that you need to be proactive. You need to always start early. Make sure that you're ahead of the game. We need to not be corporate. We need to try to be casual. All of the conversations that we see in any kind of engagement platform that is successful is usually very informal. People are on WhatsApp all the time. That's what we tell companies nowadays. Write as if you're talking to a friend on WhatsApp. Don't be formal and ask them big questions. Try to make that human connection first so that they feel that there's a safety net and then they can go ahead and tell you more and say why they are so good as they say they are. Be flexible. Candidates have a hard time fitting into boxes. I think we all do as well. So we need to allow them to grow. We need to allow them to explain themselves and really share some of that motivation. Increase your reach. Go for motivation. It's not important just to get more applications or to get people that are going to be looking more at your jobs. What we want is motivation. If we're talking about people to bring your business forward, we want them to have that vision. Be motivated. You don't want to tell them what to do every day. They have to have that drive. And when you increase your reach, you touch point with a lot more candidates that have the profile you want, but you are able to pinpoint more that attitude that we so much want. Last but not least, be online, but be human. Try to be funny. Try to be human. Try to share a story. Try to make sure that they feel relatable and they feel that they can approach you. Because these are the main things that will make any recruitment campaign perform much better. Thank you very much. <laughs> there is no LinkedIn here, but feel free to add me if you like. And I just wanted to round it off by saying one thing before we jump over to the questions. And that is the idea that just in the beginning of the week, and I didn't have uh, the chance to add this to the presentation, but we are seeing a lot of changes in the industry. We're seeing a lot of changes in terms of where candidates are aiming. What does this mean? This means that a few weeks back, or a few months, or almost years back, the most well-sorted place for work was the UK. Everybody. We always ask candidates, what is it that they have done? The hardcore skills, and a little bit about their dreams. We're a career service. We want to get you there. And we asked them, where would you like to go? What is your dream career? And the number one place was always the UK. It didn't change for many, many years. And I'm very, very glad to say to you guys that it is changing now. <laughs> so basically, 76% of all of the candidates registered in our database that had indicated they wanted to go to the UK are now being redirected to other places. So in the beginning of the year, I had 20,000 candidates that wanted to move from anywhere in Europe to Russia to look for a job opportunity. And as of today, and I checked this today, <laughs> we have 93,000. This is a very, very big wave of talent that wouldn't normally be going to Saxo Bank and Bloomberg and all these really big players there, but now they want to find a second option. So when we talk about being proactive, being at the right time and being motivated, the time is now. If I can help you in any way, of course, it's my pleasure. But thank you very much for your time. And I'll answer any questions you have. <laughs> thank you. Thank you you want to have this? Yes. Questions. Anybody has any questions? If not, it's because it was very clear. So it's not a problem. <laughs> you can ask questions. <laughs> no? No? It's not a problem. No questions? We're going to be making this presentation online, available very, very soon. So you have all this data. But again, if there is any extra questions or anything that I can help with, I'll be here today Thomas, and tomorrow. Thomas, may I still ask you a question? Yes, you may. <laughs> you mentioned, it was really a wow moment. You mentioned that so many people want to actually uh, go and work in Russia. Do you actually, have you researched the reason? What is the motivation for them? Are they, are they the people from uh, Europe who want to move to Russia? Yeah, there are people from Europe. What do you think is the, that drives them looking towards? <laughs> the weather, of course. <laughs> no, I think that the biggest reason why they are trying to move to other places is because they see that there are other countries developing to reach what the UK was in the past. They see that the market here, regardless of its 
limitations or its differences. It is a market that is developing. It is also a market that gives them different opportunities, and they definitely think it's a way to move forward. We're investigating a lot by nationality now. Again, this is very, very recent data, so I will be able to provide you with some more, but only uh, in a few weeks when we get all the responses. Yeah? I will take in line regarding the questions. Beautiful. So you already mentioned in your slides as well that it's really important to have this communication between the companies and also between the universities. Yes. So this is something that we have been seeing in Estonia as well, that it's really highly successful to start this kind of communication already in the early stage. Yes. But what would you say in your experience, um, the initiative needs to come from the employee employer side, so what they can do to actually start this conversation. I yeah. don't know what is the situation in St. Petersburg, how much this kind of dialogue is going on, but um, as your opinion, from where to start? Yeah, from the conversations that we have had with these two universities, with quite a few others all around Europe, so in Spain, France, Portugal, everywhere, the majority of these universities are, are receiving a lot of requests from employers. So they receive a lot of emails about this. And they normally choose the ones that are providing the candidates with value and knowledge. So if I was to approach a university being a company myself, I would offer them some kind of value, teaching them a skill, teaching them, upgrading them about the industry, but anything that provides those candidates with really substantial value that will allow them to later on find a job. Thank you. You give some and you get some, and you win and you lose. That's life, right? <laughs> uh, hello, thank you very much for your speech. It was thank you. outstanding. Um, I would like to ask you, uh, have you researched, uh, so we we on IT conference, and uh, probably you have statistic uh, about uh, uh, how many students uh, would like to go in IT sphere and maybe non-IT sphere. So mm -hmm. maybe you have some researches. Yeah. Uh, because we work with the candidates as soon as they start university, I'll be very honest and say that very often they have already chosen the path uh, that they would like to work on. So if they are studying IT, very often they would like to continue. But we definitely see that all of the universities, regardless of the majors that we're speaking about, are trying to make their educations more digital. Yeah? Um, making it more appealing and making it more touching with digital world. So I think that it's not about having them choose IT, but it's about proving to them that everything has to do with IT and explaining a little bit into how they can actually um, get basic knowledge, but that would allow them to develop this way. We see candidates that study IT going into everything. So the same way we see candidates that study everything else going into IT, <laughs> if that answers the question. Yeah? Anybody else? Yeah? Thanks a lot sure. for the presentation. And uh, my question is that uh, do we believe that recruiting through internship is mm -hmm. still an effective way for young talents to get their job? I believe it is. I believe it is from the data that we have because um, very often it happens that companies receive a lot of applications and it's not only about how that candidate is fitting with the culture and, and uh, the hard skills, but it's about how they perform. And it's about how quick they learn. And it is a big investment to hire somebody, especially somebody right off university that you don't really know. So internships are a great way to test these off. Sometimes it happens that candidates go for one internship, they decide to go another way, but learning what you're not good at is also very, very good. And I think that from a company perspective, it's very interesting to give you a chance to try them, to really see how do they perform and how do they work together. So internships are very, very great. What we are seeing a lot happening in Scandinavia now are what the, one of the universities mentioned called mini thesis. So it's not a long internship. It's simply a little project that they give to that student. It's a shorter period, and they just get to test his approach. Once again, to really access more about their thought process than what they have done in the past. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Any more questions? Yeah. We still have some time. Beautiful. Hi, Thomas. Thank you for the presentation. I do have a question. So you, you. spoke a lot about uh, Danish university students there. So what would be the qualities that make Danish students stand out? What is it that they're looking for when yeah. they're um, like trying to move abroad from Denmark? Um, there are two parts to this question, if you don't <laughs> mind. I will separate them. The first one is what Thank makes you. the IT students from Denmark good? 
And the second one is why they're going abroad. I think that the main reason what makes them good, <laughs> I'm going to be very transparent, education in, Scandin in Denmark especially is a 24-7 job, and you get a full-time salary to study. So you actually get, it's an average of 1,200 euros, so that you're a student, and that allows you to not worry about rent, or food, but actually develop your skills a little bit more. So I think that because they have a little bit of a lower stress level, that's why they tend to um, be a little bit better. Oof. Again, that was not me. Sorry. <laughs> and uh, why would they like to move abroad? I think it's because of the weather. <laughs> it is the most common feedback that I get from students in Denmark. They say, no. <laughs> So they want to move abroad. They want to have adventures. They want, I think nowadays, the mentality of these millenniums is that there's one place, and it's the world. <laughs> they don't necessarily feel so grounded to one place or another. As long as they feel, and I just would like to make another point with this question, if that's okay, because something that we see a lot is that some companies offer a fantastic salary, and others don't. But we often see that even though the salaries might not be better in some locations, candidates still want to go there. And that has to do with the touch point. That has to do with them feeling like they have a hand, that the company is helping them get to where they want to be. Because these people don't know so much. They are very, very junior. They're very innocent. <laughs> so they need to have somebody that teaches them and guides them. And if you're able to provide that, whether it's in Russia, in Estonia, Spain, that is always the main factor that makes them move for an opportunity. One more, and I have chocolate for everybody uh, that asked a question in the end. <laughs> um, hi, Thomas. Uh, yes. Thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. I was actually surprised when you said that the April is the month when a lot of people are in search of job. Can you explain why this is April? Why this tendency? Yeah. Um, why it's April? That I don't think I have an answer for. Um, I can provide you with the data that I have. April is the best time to recruit interns and people for graduate programs. January and February are the best times for full-time positions, and September and October are the best times for full-time positions after summer. So January, February, September, October, April, and then it goes, and then it can go really, really nerdy. Then if you, what we do is many companies approach us and they say we want. French speaking IT in Malta. <laughs> and then we go into detail and see when those people are actually applying more. But it has a lot more to do with the, the factors affecting them in their local place than, uh, than anything else. I think the biggest peaks is because of their exams. <laughs> yes. Is that it? Guys, I think that's it for now. I just wanted to say thank you. I get to nominate somebody that had the best question, right? Yes, please. Yes, please. You have to choose someone. So uh, we have this book here about results. And I'm actually going to give it to you because I thought your question was really, really good. Could you provide her with that? No, I'll do it. There you go. Thank you. But, um, but we'll be around. And there is another day. So you just come by, and it will be a pleasure to speak a little more. But I just wanted to say thank you for your time and for being here today. Appreciate it. Thank you, Thomas. <laughs> thank you.